Mark Ferguson is a jazz pianist, trombonist, composer, arranger, producer, and music educator. In this episode, you get to hear him perform three of his original compositions on piano. We talk about his mentors, perspectives on music education, and the interesting twists and turns in his varied career. He's performed with many of the world's great artists, including Ella Fitzgerald, Tony Bennett, Gil Evans, Aretha Franklin, Rob McConnell and the Boss Brass, Holly Cole, and Manteca. His website's linked in the description. All these episodes are available on all the podcast players, as well as video, and the transcripts are published to my blog. Everything's linked to my podcast website, leahroseman.com, in the description. I've included timestamps in the description for all the many topics that we cover. Good morning, Mark Ferguson. Thanks so much for joining me. Hi, Leah. Thank you for having me. So you Looking forward to chatting with yeah. you. Um, before we get into it, you I'm sure you don't remember this, but I remember the very first time I met you. You know how we do so many wonderful concerts, and you often don't remember the great concerts, but the really bad ones you remember. So <laughs> this was a wedding well, gig. I'm glad I, could, I'm glad I could be part of your bad gig. <laughs> well, I think your part of the gig was great. That was what was so funny. Oh, so I think it's I the see, last okay. gig I did kind of like this uh, soon after I joined the NAC Orchestra. So my husband Mark and I were playing violin duets in the hallway of the Chateau Laurier. Uh, don't don't tell me. I was just going to say Chateau Laurier. I do remember. Really? And you were yep. leading a yep. big band, and I believe Kelly Lee Evans was singing with you. Oh, is that right? And you were right? holding wow. your trombone. And... And Mark said, yeah, like he plays trombone and, and piano. He's really good. And you, were, you told me about Callie Lee Evans, who I hadn't heard of before, who's a guest on this wow. podcast. And um, you, you were having a great that time. You had been... a big ballroom, you know, with this big band. Yeah. And we were in the hallway yeah. and we couldn't hear <clears throat> each other. And they, I, I love that people hire live music for their weddings. But these people... Were, were we drowning you out? Yeah, yeah. Were we drowning you out? I'm, I apologize for that. I believe you were in one room. And then in the other room, there was another band. And then they just had us for like visual effect as people walk through <laughs> these two violinists. So, well, those yeah. those were the days when they had live music in every room in the Chateau Laurier. Yeah, you know it doesn't happen anymore. Actually, in the eighties, there was an amazing jazz club there. I don't know if you were the Cock and Lion. Sure. I used to go yeah. when I was a kid. Actually, my dad. Used yeah, to. I, I I was living in Toronto at the yeah. time, but um, they would book the same acts at Basin, uh, sorry Bourbon Street in on Queen Street mm-hmm. West in Toronto. And then they would come to Ottawa. So yeah, I, I and I saw a few acts at the at the Cock and Line too. It was it was great. It was when I moved to Toronto and I could see all my jazz heroes uh, for the price of a plate of spaghetti. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. It was yeah, so, so great. Yeah. So you grew up in Ottawa as well. I did. I was I was born in Montreal, mm-hmm. and uh, moved here when I was five, and um, lived here until I was twenty. And when I moved to Toronto. Yeah. So you went to Humber College to study with one of your heroes? Yeah, I did. Um, well, I, I went to Humber College because I'd heard it was the jazz school in, uh, in uh, Canada. And um, I didn't start studying with, um, I, I think the guy who was the biggest influence on me was Jerry Johnson. Oh, okay. He was my trombonist. And um, I started studying, studying with him in my second year there. But uh, it was just, it was a fantastic place to meet musicians and, uh, and just to, to play and learn. It was, it was a great experience. That was late 70s, Yeah. you know, and then I was there in the early 80s too. So when you started uh, studying jazz trombone with him, um, had you, like I assume you started trombone in high school, had you done much jazz with the trombone yet? Um, yeah, I tried. I was sort of, you know, doing it on my own. I wasn't, um, I was just learning from listening to records and, and doing what I could. Um, but I hadn't really studied with a, a jazz player at that point. Um, I really started on piano and, and studied with uh, a really great piano teacher, Lila Flat. It was, uh, it was a great name for a, a piano teacher, Mrs. Flat. Mm-hmm. And uh, she got me started, but at some point I, I, I got a fake book with uh, lead sheets in it, and I showed her, I said, I'm really interested in learning to do this. I said, like, what does the C major seven mean? And she said, I have no idea. So, <laughs> so at that point, I started just kind of spending a lot of time at the piano by myself, learning by trial and error. And uh, I really was kind of self-taught in that way with jazz, I think. Mm-hmm. Were you still taking classical piano lessons at that point, or did you drop it? 
Yeah, I stopped, uh, I think I got to grade eight conservatory. I stopped when I was about um, 17, I guess. Um, but I, I, I had a lot of uh, really diverse influences in Ottawa. I, you know, uh, there's of course the school band and uh, and then I joined the Ottawa Youth Orchestra, and I also joined rock bands. And in those days, horn bands were a big deal. Chicago, mm -hmm. Blood, Sweat and Tears, Lighthouse. And um, so I played all the funky little bars over in Hull when I was about, uh, you know, 15, 16, uh, underage. But um, the Ottawa House, the Standish Hall, um, Chaudier Club, uh, all these, these places are all gone now. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, so the, it was. I really had a kind of a diverse kind of um, musical experience, and and that's. I've always loved a lot of different types of music. So it was. It was a great uh, training ground for me. Were you playing trombone on all those gigs, or sometimes keyboard? Um, I was playing mostly trombone at that point. And when I moved to Toronto, I didn't tell anybody I played piano because I just wanted to concentrate on trombone. And in in those days, there was quite a. Uh, a thriving studio scene in Toronto so that was my idea that I was going to move to Toronto and become a studio musician and uh, I did do a lot of uh, recording gigs but r early 80s um, you know they came out with the DX7 and digital synthesis and guys started creating jingles in their own in their bedrooms you know so it just put a lot of uh, a lot of musicians out of work at that point but so uh, yeah I was but I was I was only I was just playing trombone in Toronto at the beginning now you just mentioned jingles. I was going to ask you about that later because you know you're a composer, and I know you've written some jingles as well as music for yeah. I've written, software. written a, a few, few not not many, yeah. but I've um, I've written a few jingles. But I I played on a lot when I was in in Toronto. You know, you just get called and go in at nine o'clock in the morning, and you're out of there by nine forty five usually. Yeah. Yeah. Usually the, the the rhythm section had already been in, and the singers, and then they were just adding the horns afterwards. How was your family's, um, uh, like, were they supportive of you playing in these bars when you were so young? How did that work out? <laughs> Surprisingly, I, you know, I, I wouldn't be that lenient with my kids. Um, but my, I'm not sure my mom knew, really knew what I was getting into. Um, she just knew I loved music yeah. and she was, they were, they were very supportive. And uh, so I, she, she, actually she did, she and my dad did come to the Chaudière Club in Hull to, or well, in uh, uh Elmer, I guess, to um, to hear me, and which, so they were very supportive. And they would come out to the youth orchestra concerts, and and uh, they were extremely supportive. But uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure she realized exactly how bad it was over there. You know, like drug dealers at the door and uh, um, uh, motorcycle gangs. And it was it was wild. Yeah, and but you know when you're when you're that age, you don't really think about it. Just hey, I'm I'm playing music for a living. I'm, they're paying me to play music. It's just. It was so great. How much did you get paid for those kind of gigs? <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid you'd ask me that. Um, no, I, I, you know, I have no memory of what I got paid, but uh, I'm sure it was peanuts. Yeah. But it was a great experience. So um, you mentioned your trombone teacher in Humber. Um, yeah. What was what were lessons with him like? Um, well, one thing I loved about. Jerry Johnson. I, I first saw Jer Jerry Johnson with Maynard Ferguson's band at the National Arts Center, I guess, when I was a teenager. And so he was kind of an idol. And uh, then when he came to teach at Humber, um, that was fantastic. And th the one thing I remember about the w his teaching style that really worked for me was that he would play at the lessons all the time. And so, you know, it was just, I was, I wanted to sound like him. So, uh, it was uh, it was great to have that experience of having somebody who could, you know, like a really virtuosic player standing beside you and, and oh, that's that's what the trombone's supposed to sound like. You know, it was great in that way. And uh, he was also um, in the house band at the Royal York Hotel. And the Royal York Hotel in Toronto um, is one of the big uh, CN hotels that they built on the on the railway, um, uh, like the Chatelier in Ottawa. And um, they had a room called the Imperial Room, which was a <coughs> beautiful, <coughs> excuse me, beautiful dining room. And they would book acts um, like Ella Fitzgerald, Tony Bennett, um, Rosemary Clooney, Rita Moreno. So I got to, uh, Jerry would hire me to play with the band when they needed another trombone player. And 
So that was a fantastic experience. I got to play with all these people, and um, it really thanks to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask you because um, those names come up when when you look up um, Mark Ferguson. It's funny Maynard Ferguson comes up too when you Google your name. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness, no, re no, rela no relation. <laughs> well, because you type, you know, Mark <laughs> well, Ferguson jazz, and then you know, there's a guy in Australia. You know about this man? Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, funny. I, I I saw that. He's. Uh, is he a, a talk show host? No, he's a jazz pianist who teaches he, at a university and also composes and arranges. Does he play trombone? I don't think he plays trombone. <laughs> but he uses his middle name, yeah. Mark Simeon Ferguson, I believe. Oh, really? Yeah, that's funny. They, there used to be a Mark Ferguson in Toronto who was a dancer, and we used to get each other's checks occasionally. Um, he eventually changed his name to Mark Cassius, but uh, uh, I met him years later on a gig somewhere. So yeah, I guess there it's a fairly Ferguson is a fairly common name. Well, it's just funny in the in and, the music and, world. And as you, <laughs> as you know, Mark is a very common name yeah. too. <laughs> You're married to one. So I was going to ask you, uh, Rob McConnell, like because you studied arranging mm -hmm. with him, right? In terms of your heroes in Toronto. Yeah, he he was he was the other big hero for me, and um, I met him when I was 19. I went out to a jazz uh, clinic, a, a week-long jazz workshop in Fredericton with Phil Nimmons and um, the, the, uh, the staff the, <laughs> were uh, Rob McConnell, Mo Kaufman, Guido Basso and, um, and Phil Nimmons group. So um, there were only two trombonists there, myself and another guy and so I, I was really like I had Rob to myself for a week. And then uh, I ended up driving back to Ontario with him, really getting to know him well. And uh, he hired me occasionally for a few things in, in Toronto. Not often, but so I got to play with the Boss Brass a few times. And uh, uh, and I did get a Canada Council grant to study arranging with Rob, which was fantastic. Yeah. It's great. I, I would go down to his place and uh, spend the weekend. You know, he'd make me dinner and we'd get up the next morning and listen. To, mostly we listen to music. It's amazing. And do you teach arranging at some of the things you learn from him in the way of teaching? Do you use those techniques? Absolutely. Yes, I do. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I actually play my, uh, because I, I teach arranging at Carleton University and uh, I play a lot of Rob McConnell's arrangements um, for my students and we, and we analyze them and so on. So yes, he was a huge influence, mm. and and also a great, fantastic trombone player too, valve trombone. But he didn't play slide trombone, right? He played valve. That's trombone? right, valve trombone. Yeah, he said he played slide trombone when he was uh, a young guy, but um, at some point switched over to valve, and it w really was his voice. You know, it was it was really uh, it was really his sound. It really worked for him. But it's can is it as expressive? Like you don't have the the between the notes. Well, you can't play glissando, yeah. but um, but uh, it, it, you have a lot more flexibility, really, because of the valves rather than having to work the slide. Um, and, I, and I've tried it, but it's a whole it's a very different animal because um, you know, as trombonists, we get used to articulating notes uh, as we move the slide, mm -hmm. and so having a valve combination and trying to articulate is uh, it's very different. It's hard to describe, but I I tried it and. Uh, um, I just went back to slide yeah. because it uh, it didn't feel right. In terms of like, they're also it's it's hard to find um, instruments that are really in tune. Okay, valve trombones. Surprisingly, I don't know why that is. Hmm. And do they bend notes with their embouchure, like for blues playing? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You can you can bend notes. You can flatten or sharpen a note with your embouchure. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, on the slide trombone, you can use your slide. Yeah. And there's never any excuse. Well, it's like playing uh, a string instrument. There's never any excuse for playing out of tune because um, uh, you, you, you should be able to find the pitch there somewhere. Yeah. So you're sitting at your other main instrument, the piano. Yes, yes. Um, do you want to take a music break? Would you be willing to play for us? Absolutely. I'd love to. So what are you going to play? Um, well, I'll, I'll play one of my own compositions. Um, this is a tune that I called F sharp, very unimaginative title. Um, the reason I called it F sharp is because it's, I, I wanted to take one note as a, a pedal point and 
just see how I could work harmonies around that one note. And uh, so it happens to be a F sharp. So um, I'm going to turn my vocal mic mm -hmm. off so that it doesn't pick it up. And uh, let me know if the sound is okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit. I've got a, a chart in front of me because I, it's been a little while since I played this tune. So I did write it, but I'm going to read. <laughs>
Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. One last F sharp at the end. <laughs> So when you said you were reading the chart, it's a lead sheet with what seems to be a very fancy chord progression. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just really, I don't know if you can see this, but it, it's really um, kind of yeah. a, oh, kind of a, kind of a uh, oh, that's hard to read, isn't it? Uh, it's kind of a skeleton. It's just um, a melody with chord symbols written above it. Yeah. And, um, and so it, it gives the performer a lot of chance to interpret it uh, however, however I want to. And uh, so it's never going to come out exactly the same, you know, two times in a row. It'll always be a little bit different. And there, and there's a, a big section for improvisation in the middle there. I think you heard. Yeah, it's it's such a cool idea to have that uh, ostinato, that repeating F sharp. And I was thinking, you know, jazz harmony. There's so much. The chords get so dense. It's all, you know, you get practically all the notes. Um, yeah, there's, there's, you know, there are just so many possibilities, and um, um, I, I something that I really like in music is when it, the harmony gets very, very dense, and then suddenly there's like a, a triad, mm -hmm. and it just it feels so fresh, and uh, somehow just a, a very simple triad can sound really um, like a revelation, you know, like the sun coming out, like uh, mm -hmm. so fresh. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting to me because it's like you have a split personality of the horn player and then the keyboard player, like, you know, because you're a rhythm player and all this, you know, harmonic complication and then just playing a horn line is, is different uh, function. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's good to have the two because um, it, uh, I've always found it, it gives me an insight into if I'm playing with the rhythm section. Uh, I know what the piano player is thinking and and how he's feeling, and uh, I'm trying to communicate with the other musicians. So, I think having the job of playing as a a soloist, I guess, or a, um, a front line player, and the job of having a uh, being in a rhythm section, it's good to have both perspectives. So that uh, it, I think it makes communication with the other musicians easier. Yeah, and you had a bit of a Latin groove going on in that tune as well. A little bit, yeah. It would, certainly wasn't a swing tune. It was uh, very much a straight eighth kind of feel. Yeah. Um, do you still have your Latin band, Los Gringos? Or? Um, you know, we've sort of put that on the back mm -hmm. burner. Um, I think the last time we played was probably before the pandemic. But I am playing with um, a great Cuban pianist, Miguel Darmes, um, who's living in Ottawa now, and uh, he is from Havana uh, originally. And um, it's his uh, compositions and arrangements are just beautiful. Really. It's the real thing, you know? It's uh, Cuban music. Are you playing trombone and with him? Yes, okay. that's right, yeah. And I also play with a band called Manteca, right. um, which is a Toronto band, and a band that I, um, you know, they've been together since the late 70s, and I was a big fan. I owned their albums and uh, used to go and hear them whenever I could, and I joined the band in uh, 2006, I believe. Yeah. It so I've been with with them for, yeah, decade and a half now. I was going to say congratulations on the relatively new album, 2020. I, I bought it. I've been listening to it. Oh, great. Uh, oh, great. That's good. Yeah, we recorded, uh, I guess, uh, four or five albums over since I was in the band, since I joined the band. Yeah. And uh, we have something nice uh, in, um, we're playing a couple of jazz festivals in uh, Markham and Prince Edward mm -hmm. County in August. And then in October, we're going back into the studio. And rather than recording um, an album, we're doing um, uh, three short sort of TV shows or podcasts. I don't, I don't know what to call them anymore. But uh, with special guests, um, uh, in the past they've been, you know, um, Canadian, kind of Canadian uh, artists. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe this time we're going to be playing with some of the offspring okay. of the members of Manteca, because a lot of them have really got on to, uh, um, you know, do some great things, the, the next generation. Yeah, that's really cool. So yeah, the it's the twelfth of never is the album I was referring to. Right, I guess that is the most recent one. Yeah. Yes. So it yeah. lists you as playing piano, trombone, bass, trombone, and I think vibes, unless that was another album. 
Yeah. No, that's right. I, I play some vibraphones. I, I don't have any technique on the vibraphone, but I'm able to add colors, okay. you know, and uh, uh, it's a nice color. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of different colors in Manteca because um, Colleen Allen, who's the, the reed player, plays everything, you know, piccolo, flute, alto flute, uh, alto saxophone, tenor saxophone, bass clarinet, uh, and accordion. Uh, so uh, there, there are just a lot of colors in the band, and vibraphone is is one that adds a nice um, a nice kind of texture and they there's a lot of hand percussion too as opposed to drum sets yes yes um there are, there's a, a drummer uh and a, a conga player who also plays all kinds of toys different different uh, percussion instruments and matt zimbel who is the leader plays congas and uh, some other some other latin percussion yeah things. so that must have been really cool that you had been listening to their albums and you were able to join the band yeah, I was I was surprised to get the call. I was living in Elmer at the mm -hmm. time, and uh, Matt called and asked if I wanted to join the band. I said yes, of course. So, uh, yeah, it's been it's been a really nice experience. I was curious if they're still based in Toronto because on Bandcamp it says Montreal is there. Matt lives in Montreal. Mm -hmm. Everyone else lives in Toronto. I live in Ottawa, but uh, most of the band are in Toronto. So that's where we rehearse, mm -hmm. and uh, most of our gigs are around the Toronto area. And you're still listed that you teach at McGill part-time? Yeah, you know, I haven't taught there since before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still on their uh, roster, but um, it's, y you know, at this at this point, I, I wasn't, I used to take the train down every Monday morning and, and you know, teach four students okay. and come home on the train. And um, it just, with uh, COVID and everything, I just didn't want to be doing that. Yeah. So I don't know what, uh, I don't know whether I will be teaching there in the future. It's hard to say. I was just curious how you managed all this commuting because you, you you do so many things. Yeah, it it was actually a great it was a good commute because I was I was on the train at uh, I lived near the train station. I was on the train at six o'clock and home by five thirty. So it was like putting in a full work. Yeah. Day. And it was and it was a uh, just a good experience, you know, to uh, get out of the city and and to be around other other musicians and uh, and meet students from well at mcgill you know they're from all over the country so it was that was a nice experience yeah i went to mcgill for my undergrad and i did mm. take um a great jazz history course which was not required but yes oh with andre white no oh okay fred great yeah did you enjoy I it? I enjoyed it very much. It was one of my most memorable oh, courses for sure. But oh, that's I was thinking that's about how siloed classical world is, and it's really unfortunate. It is. You know, uh, that's interesting you mentioned that because I'm playing at Music and Beyond tomorrow night with um, a colleague from Carleton, James McGowan, mm -hmm. who has written, um, uh, I guess you'd call it a suite, several pieces for... Um, string quartet, um, rhythm section, jazz rhythm section, and four horns. Um, no, yeah, four horns, that's right. Ed Lister, Pete Cancura, Mike Tremblay, and, and myself. And, um, and he's playing piano. And it's very much um, a fusion of classical and jazz and gospel, and, um, and I'd say there are some funk or rock elements in there too. So, uh, you do hear occasionally a successful um, fusion of the of the two musics, and I know you just worked with Esperanza Spaulding. Am I correct? Oh yeah, we did. But I, yeah. I don't mean that that we don't play stuff together. What I mean mm -hmm. is in our education. Ah, I see. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Uh, you know, when yeah, I I did my degree at Ottawa U, and it was. Uh, exclusively classical and then I went to Humber Humber actually we had to um, we had to combine the two mm -hmm. we, we there I took a, uh, a music history course and uh, and I played a lot of you know the Bach cello suites and uh, uh, all kinds of classical mm -hmm. music so they certainly weren't snobbish about you know like all you're gonna do is jazz uh, so I, I love that I I don't like um, I don't like those kind of barriers between different types of music. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm a big fan. And, and I think it's, you know, it's not at the same as it was like 20 or 30 years ago. I don't think um, education is as uh, siloed mm -hmm. as, you, as you put it. 
um, it seems like there's more of a mixture now. That, I'm glad to hear that. I don't know. Like you would mm -hmm. know better than me. Um, about that. Well, certainly at, Carlt at Carlton, uh, it's a pretty broad kind of department. There's a singer-songwriter program mm -hmm. and and jazz. There's even a Celtic studies program. So they're really, you know, mixing everything together. It's a real kind of melting pot. Yeah. Mosaic? Melting pot, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, Megan, Megan was, was Megan also... Megan was a student at Carlton. Yeah, she, yeah. she mentioned how great yeah. um, a jazz theory teacher you were. And another oh, guest, Kelly nice. Lee Evans, also mentioned, you know. Yes, Kelly Kelly Lee was coming to my classes for a few years there. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, she's she doesn't need it. She's got this amazing career, and uh, and she's so good at what she does. But I thought it was really great that she wanted to learn more about the music, you know, get deeper into it. Well, I think someone like her, she's so incredibly intuitive and just learns by osmosis, but she hadn't exactly. learned to read music until very late in right. her career. Well, that makes me think of somebody I worked with back in the 80s, Ella Fitzgerald. She, yeah. she, she didn't read music at all and uh, learned everything by ear and, you know, was perfect. Incredible. Yeah. Um, I was wondering in terms of, um, like, your teaching, we talked a little bit about orchestration and having students listen. And I was hearing at Carleton the way uh, the theory is taught is quite oral as well, which is so different than the way I learned theory, which was so dry and... Mm. all written and yeah um yeah i mean you know there is that um i, I don't teach the first year theory courses mm. so most of the dry stuff you know just uh, learning the the basics i yeah. hopefully it's already taken care of um so we i i make sure that theory is not just taught in a vacuum we we listen to a lot of music mm -hmm. that was that was one of the things actually it's kind of the opposite of what we're talking about but uh, coming up in the conservatory system playing piano, uh, I would just learn pieces and, you know, the, the beautiful, great selections. You know, the way the conservatory book was set up with Baroque and Renaissance mm -hmm. and then the middle was uh, Romantic and then the last part was 20th century. Um, but there was never any discussion of why, what the harmonies were or why they worked the way they did, why this chord leads to the next chord. Um, so I... I would have loved to have had more of that kind of theoretical knowledge back then that just would make more sense of the music to me. It was, it was beautiful music to play, but you're kind of doing it by rote, you know, you're learning you're learning the notes and but not really learning why they're why the composers chose those notes. Mm -hmm. One thing that always um, amazes me about uh, jazz players who you know, who do a lot of gigs like yourself, is how you have such a library of tunes in your head with all those progressions. Yeah. Well, you know, I was really fortunate to um, work with, uh, for, you know, over 20 years, I guess, with a, a great saxophone player named Huey O'Connor, who uh, who he died in his 90s just a few years ago. Um, but I would, we always had a, a gig somewhere. We played at Claire de Lune in the market for many years, and we always had a Friday or Saturday or Sunday gig. And um, we never used any, he didn't bring out charts, you know, there was no music. So he'd say, you know, do you know uh, this tune? Do you know Body and Soul? And I'd say, yeah, I think so. And, and if I didn't know a tune, I'd go away. And next week when I came back, I would, I would have learned it. But uh, just, you know, when you play with music in front of you all the time, it's, it's a crutch. You don't ever get away from the music. If you want to learn to play without music, you got to take the sheet music away. So that was great for me to learn tunes. And he would—he was very patient. You know, I would play horribly sometimes and and screw up. But he would—he would play on his horn what the chords were. You know, outlining the chords, and uh, and he knew all the all the hip chords, all the great you know the really good sounding uh, uh, harmonizations. So I was really fortunate to play with him for years, and that's where I learned a lot of the repertoire. Okay. And this might sound silly, but they, even the name of the tune, I don't know how you sort that out. Is it like automatically once you know the tune, you know the name? Uh, you know, I'm really bad with uh, remembering titles of tunes. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really good with, I always remember the key that it's in. But, you know, I'll be on the bandstand sometimes and say, let's play, you know, the tune in F, you know, the... That goes like you this. You know, that, that tune in F, yeah, it goes like this. Right. So, uh, 
Yeah, it, well, you know, um, I think learning the titles of the tunes, something that I think is really important, and a lot of jazz musicians um, feel this way, is learning the lyric to a tune. Hmm. Because it gives you another, another frame of reference. You don't get lost in the tune if, if you're thinking of a lyric in your head. Hmm. In fact, there's a, a famous story about, I think it was Ben Webster, who was a great tenor saxophone player who played with Duke Ellington and all kinds of people. And uh, he was at a jam session. He was playing a tune, and he just stopped playing at some point. And someone asked him afterwards, well, why did you stop playing? And he said, I forgot the words. You know, so that, that's, that's a really good... Uh, kind of indication of how important the lyric can be. And also you, you want, if you're playing My Funny Valentine, for instance, um, it's kind of, a, you know, the lyrics are very self-deprecating and, and kind of sad in a way. And uh, if you're playing it, uh, you know, it just has nothing to do with the original uh, concept of the tune. So I, I think that's another important reason to learn the lyrics. Mm -hmm. And I, I was I was trying to get my students to learn the lyrics. Not always successfully, but uh, I try. So do you sing when you're learning a new tune? Um, not really, but I listen to a lot of recordings of, of you know, if I want to learn a tune, I'll I will go back, I'll go on, because everything's available on YouTube now, it's great. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll go to like a version by Frank Sinatra, because usually he'll sing it pretty straight or um, you know I won't I won't listen to Billie Holiday so much because she'll she changes all the all the uh, melody notes mm -hmm. so uh, I, I li try to listen to a, a several versions but I start with somebody who I know is going to sing the melody pretty much the way it was written and then of course learning uh, being able to play a tune in different keys is really important too. I've, I've worked with a lot of singers and um, you know singers are, are famous for do, doing tunes in not the standard keys so that's been a great experience having to learn you know autumn leaves or, or, or whatever key it is in um, you get to know the function of the chord rather than the chord itself and that means you can play it in any key this was that was going to be my next question was okay. about transposition and working with singers. So, yes, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's um, it's it's an unfortunate fact that most of the tunes that uh, young jazz musicians learn from the fake books were written by males because mm. they're they're songs from the you know thirties and forties, not exclusively, but uh, a lot of them were. And so they're generally about a fourth or a fifth away from the standard female voice. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, most people will learn, um, let's see, for instance, uh, uh, Misty. So most people will learn it in E flat. But you get on a gig and the singer's gonna say, uh, let's do Misty in A flat or A. Or something. So knowing that the first chord is the one chord, it, it's it's the one chord. So if I'm in A flat, I know it's the one chord. So mm -hmm. it's it's not. I'm not thinking it's an E flat chord. I'm thinking it's a one chord. Yeah. And and so it's uh, it, it takes a lot of practice to to get to get good at that. But it's just a matter of doing it a lot, playing tunes in different keys. Is it easier as a keyboard player than like as a horn player or but then you have more notes I, to play? <laughs> I think it is. Uh, I think it is because the piano is a visual instrument mm -hmm. and, um, you know, you can see what you're doing. And uh, you've got um, you've got the whole orchestra in front of you, really. Mm -hmm. um, if you're playing one note at a time, it's. I think it can be tougher. Uh, that's why whenever I uh, teach, because sometimes I teach, um, you know, someone will come to me who's a singer or saxophone player or whatever a bass player and um, uh, I always get them to play some piano uh, it's really important that I think that every musician plays piano they don't have to be great pianists but just just to have some keyboard technique mm -hmm. not even technique uh, uh, keyboard harmony knowledge really yeah I'm kind of curious about voicing because for someone like me who's like super basic pianist yeah I can like 
plunk down the chords, but I can't begin to think about how to, you know. Right. Could you maybe give us a... Sure, go ahead. Well, maybe just give us an example of like a standard tune and like show us different ways you can voice it. So it'd be like... Sure. Um, So, uh, well, I was talking about... um, I was talking about Misty, why don't we mm-hmm. look at that. So the standard, uh, most people, when they learn chords, they learn them in root position. Yeah. And unfortunately, root position chords are probably the worst sounding chords you can have. So the first chord in Misty is an E flat major seven. So that's root position. But if I leave out the fifth and the root in my right hand, and just make a really simple sounding voicing. So I've got the root in my left hand and the third and the seventh in my right hand. It's much clearer, more transparent than... So there's, yeah, voicings, uh, that's a huge area of study. Um, and, you know, listening to the great ones like Bill Evans, Oscar Peterson, people like that, uh, you know, they, they've they just put so much thought into voicings. And it's not always just about playing the chord, it's about the inner moving voices. So it's it can be as much about counterpoint as mm-hmm. about just harmony. And you do a lot of arranging. So is that a large part of what you're doing? And are you doing it at the piano? Um, yeah, I, I, well, you know, a, a lot of my arranging now I, I do at the computer, but I, mm-hmm. I was a, an arranger pre-computer, so I had to, I'm glad that I had to do it on staff paper mm-hmm. um, without being able to hear it played back by, by the computer program. Um, uh, so, yeah, I guess uh, I, I do still arrange at the piano, but um, I guess you, you get to a certain point where you know some voicings are going to work and some aren't. So um, it's, uh, and then sometimes it'll surprise you. You'll, you'll write something that you don't think is going to work and it sounds great. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I'll write something, I'll voice everything out very in very lush voicings, um, dense harmonies, and then go back and realize that if I just had everybody playing in unison, it would have sounded way better. So sometimes, uh, you know, you put a lot of work in and realize, ah, oh, didn't have to do all that work. Yeah. So I'm curious how you balance, um, like, how do you stay in shape as a trombone player? It takes a lot of work just to... Yeah, it's, it's. Uh, I mean, I have to play every day. Um, and it's, well, you talk to any brass player and, and you'll, you'll know that uh, maintenance is a really important thing. Long tones, flexibilities, tonguing exercises. Uh, just to keep this in shape, keep the embouchure in shape. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it, it was interesting during the pandemic because uh, for the first time in my life, I didn't pick up the trombone for about over a month. Mm-hmm. And I'd, I'd never done that before. Um, so I had to kind of get my chops back after afterwards. But there just weren't any gigs, you know, and, and uh, everybody was on pause for a little while there. Did you still practice piano or still play? I still played piano, sure. And, yeah. and you know, during the pandemic, uh, I did a lot online. Um, people would either send me tracks and they'd ask me to play on the tracks or um, or through syncspace.live, which was a, a great platform for doing concerts online. Yeah, I've heard you s- so many concerts on Syncspace. And in my interview with Diane Nalini, of course, we talked about how yeah. that got going. Yeah. Yeah, she she and uh, her husband Adrian uh, have been absolutely fantastic. It's just really, it was really a boost to all of us musicians uh, just to to have a place to play and and to keep our spirits up and uh, and mm-hmm. to be able to express ourselves. It was uh, really have to thank them for that. Were you teaching online a little bit, like through the university? Yeah, I yeah I taught. Um, I didn't enjoy it, but I taught two courses. Uh, in the well from each semester mm-hmm. um, and it was a lot of work just getting the technology together was a lot mm-hmm. of work and um, 
I didn't enjoy, I, I just didn't get to know my students. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, basically I was recording classes and they could watch them whenever they wanted. So I never really got to, uh, to know my students and I didn't enjoy that part of it. And then this past year, we were back in the classroom masked, but at least we were in the classroom together. Yeah. So that was better. Do you see changes in our industry going forward as a result of this pandemic that will stay? I think um, I think that some of the online platforms are, are going to stay and probably get better. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, yourself, you're, you're doing these um, podcasts, and I would imagine that was started during the pandemic. Definitely, right? yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's one of the great things about being able to play online is I was doing a lot of concerts with musicians I'd never met before who live in Toronto or Montreal or um, uh, even New York, you know. So uh, I think it'll, you know, it makes the world a smaller place. You, you can play with people uh, who aren't in, your, in the same vicinity as you are. I can see it being being a real boost for that. But still, you know, there's nothing like playing together in the same room with people. <laughs> and, and the audience and, right there and, and reacting. An, an audience, yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, well, we talked a little bit about, um, like, voicing and also, like, in terms of being a rhythm rhythm section. And I was, I was listening. I'd, I'd love for you to play again. I was just listening very carefully to the way you varied... You know, you had this ostinato, but still the rhythmic feel kept changing because that's mm. the brilliance of a great rhythm player is that it's not all the same. Right. Um, I'm sorry, was there a question in there? Or, There's uh, going to be a question, yeah. Is okay. this a, <laughs> at this point, I imagine it's not a conscious process, but maybe at the beginning it was that you'd think, oh, I better mix it up or learning from great yeah, rhythm players. That's, no, that's an interesting question um, because, you know, you really as a as a jazz musician you have to learn the language of bebop you know the language of Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie and um, <clears throat> excuse me and then kind of not forget it but um, internalize it and um, not have to think about it a lot as you're playing and of course with any type of music um, time is so important rhythm is the most important thing so um, that's why I think it's important to play with others. Uh, you know, you can. I've heard some good players who didn't have good time because they they played by themselves mostly. So I think that's really important to. Uh, I, I really think that rhythm is the most important uh, component of music, beyond harmony or anything. Um, and it doesn't matter what kind of music you're playing. It's 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 the most important thing. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, I've always practiced with a metronome to get that kind of strict metronomic time together. Uh, of course, you don't want to do that when you're playing uh, for real. But uh, that's how I, you know, that was one of the ways I worked on my time. Um, and some, you know, some people don't, don't uh, believe in using metronomes. But I, I always, I just think it's so important to trust other people's time when you're playing with them mm-hmm. but I mean the feel like just the the type of groove you're giving the music and the way it gets changed up so it's that's what I'm talking about oh I see um, yeah groove well um, again that's a uh, I think that's a, something that you learn from listening to a lot of music and um, and uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I, I I'm having trouble answering that question. Okay. Um, just... Yeah, it's. I think it is a real matter of listening and getting to know the music. For example, playing with Miguel's Cuban band. Uh, for a lot of us Canadian musicians, it's really we're like we're like fish out of water because we're trying to get these uh, rhythms that we just didn't grow up with, and and the the Cuban guys in the rhythm section are are playing amazing things. Sometimes it's hard to figure out where one is, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, it really has a lot to do with listening. That's that's what I would say. Okay. So osmosis as well as like conscious, yeah. focused listening. Yeah, you have to immerse yourself in the music, that's for sure. Yeah. 
I think a big loss in this pandemic for young musicians has been the lack of being able to play together. You know, bands were yep. canceled and right. Not, and yes, know. absolutely. Yeah, I, I felt so sorry for the a lot of the high school musicians who finally had a chance to play with the band and they there was nothing for two or three years. Yeah. Um, yeah, I forgot what it is. I was going to go somewhere else, and I've forgotten where I was going. Well, I was going to yeah. ask you about doing high school clinics, because I know it's something you've done in your career, and I was kind of curious mm. the kind of things you work on, because these kids are a pretty basic level, usually. Yeah, and, um, um, uh, you know, they're usually really pretty curious, and they, mm. they kind of, they know they want a piece of, of what we're doing, but they don't know how to get there, so... Again, um, I just really recommend I, I talk about listening to, you know, like, do, do you know who Louis Armstrong is? Do you know who Duke Ellington is? Do you know who Count Basie is? Do you know who Charlie Parker is? Miles Davis? And um, and just trying to, to uh, make them aware of, because uh, we're, not, we're not exposed to any of that type of music on the radio, or uh, you have to seek it out. So that's why uh, at the clinics, I really talk a lot about the, the history of the music and um, and we get to the nuts and bolts of, of chords and scales and all that stuff but um, really trying to get them to hear music that I think that you know a lot of them are really gonna it's not gonna connect with everybody but uh, a lot of them are really gonna get turned on by um, something they haven't heard before and if I can expose them to something like that that's um, I feel like uh, it's a as a young musician that's what I that's what I appreciated was uh, having an older musician ask me if I'd heard so and so, and then kind of usually it would you know it'd be we'd I'd move back because um, so I've heard uh, Miles Davis who came before my oh Dizzy Gillespie who came before Dizzy Gillespie Roy Eldridge who came before uh, Louis Armstrong so working your way through the the history of the music is a great thing so that's that's what I try to do at clinics make make the students aware of. The history and the tradition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, could you play another tune for us? Would you be willing? I'd to love that? to. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm going to play a tune that um, I wrote. Uh, I guess about uh, probably about ten years ago now, and I'd been on the road in California for about uh, three weeks, and I came home and was with my family and around all my stuff and my piano and um, everyone had, my wife had gone to work the kids had gone to school and I sat down at the piano and the, and the piece just kind of wrote itself uh, and it was a really um, it was kind of a celebration of being at home again um, and so I called it home I've since learned that there are about a million songs out there called home but uh, this is my version of home And I've, I've recorded this a couple of times. I recorded it uh, uh, on an album, a duo album with Mike Tremblay. And then again, um, I did it with my trio with John Gaggy and uh, Scott Latham. So this is Home. I'm going to turn the vocal mic off. <laughs> Thank you. 
Gorgeous. Thanks so much. What a great tune. Thank you, Leah. Big C major triad at the end. Yeah, some, definitely some gospel sonorities in there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it just really, uh, it, it kind of, uh, I, I hope it, it, you know, it expresses the kind of exuberance I, I felt at being home after being away for a long time. Yeah, I, I think it expresses a, a peaceful kind of... Yeah, good. <laughs> um, I was trying to think who it was. I think it was Kelly Lee Evans was saying she learned that you shouldn't tell an audience too much about a tune before you present it because it'll bias them. True. And at the same time, it's, it's sometimes it's nice to set up something so that people have kind of an image in their mind. So I guess I'm saying the opposite of what Kelly Lee was saying. Yeah. But, um, and, you know, when, when Kelly Lee does a tune, she has the advantage of having a lyric, too. So uh, I think when you're playing instrumental music, I know people love it when you talk to them at, at a concert. Um, and I notice, uh, you know, in, in the NACO now, uh, that Alexander Shelley's very good at that, setting up a piece of music so that people have some frame of reference when they listen to an instrumental piece of music. And it, it, it gives you something to think about when you're listening to it. Yeah, I really like that. And certainly when I uh, play chamber music concerts, I really, um, it's helped me with my nerves, although it's a different kind of nerves to talk to people, but you feel yeah. more connected with them. Absolutely, yes. Uh, the audience certainly appreciates it. And I, actually, speaking of nerves, so you're one of these people that doesn't really get nervous performing for people, but when you were younger and you were learning the ropes, it must have been a different, like learning to improvise in public. Yeah, that that's pretty scary. Um, but, you know, to, to be honest, I was just so in love with it and uh, so kind of, you know, driven like one... I was, on, on, I was on one track, you know, and I just, uh, I didn't really think about it all that much, I don't think. I was just, like, really having fun and um, trying to learn and, and get better. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm still doing, trying yeah. to learn and get better. Yeah. Do you have any upcoming projects or, like, uh, are you writing new tunes for a new album? Um, I'm doing, uh, I'm thinking about uh, recording a bunch of solo piano pieces that I've written over quite a few years and they're all kind of representative of members of my family my immediate family and my extended family and uh, they're not necessarily jazz pieces they're I don't I wouldn't know how to describe them but um, um, I'm thinking about doing that um, as a project over the next over the next little while and uh, other than that um, it's mostly you know working with the bands that I play with Manteca and uh, yeah. and Miguel Darmas and um, uh, uh, there's also a really great band that I, I write for sometimes Ed Lister's uh, Prime Rib uh, Prime Rib Band yeah it's a big band you know mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's really a, um, a neat project I, was, I just remembered it was not Kelly Lee Evans that said that it was Diane Nalini because she was saying there's certain oh, songs yeah. she sings that yeah. have a completely different meaning than people ascribe to them um, ah interesting yeah yeah I was going to ask you about the whole big band thing because a lot of the playing you've done and is like yeah this totally different sound to this intimate you know solo piano or small mm -hmm. ensemble that I've mostly mm -hmm. heard you play. Do you feel like right. there's different parts of your personality that come out? Um, that's a very good question. I don't think I'd be the best judge. I think you know a, an audience member would be the best judge. Um, but uh, I, I think that I probably have a different voice on the piano. Uh, than I do on the trombone. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, I, f I find that tr the uh, playing a wind instrument is a much more physical thing, and so um, I, I know I'm a fairly gentle piano player. I, I have a fairly soft touch. I don't uh, I don't bang on the piano at all. So I I would think that I'm probably more aggressive on the when I'm playing a wind instrument than I'm on the piano. That, maybe that seems like an obvious uh, thing that you would be. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, it's also just the sound, uh, you know, these, these yeah. bands are, like, it's such a different yes. art form, really. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I don't, don't do a lot of, a lot of big band playing anymore. I, it, when I was in Toronto, I mm -hmm. played in a lot of big bands. I guess there were just, you know, more musicians doing that back then. Yeah. But uh, I really, you know, we play once a month at, at a club on Bank Street, and uh, it's really, it's like a party every, every time. You know, I'm curious about the um, how 
like the not the demographics but how popular jazz is because I've always thought of it as very niche but what's yeah. interesting what I was looking on YouTube for like I was literally looking for um, YouTube's about jazz harmony because I was curious to learn some more right yeah these videos are getting like you know half a million hits like who are these people I know well the world's a big place and they yeah. they're, they have, they've got the whole world as their audience now um, yeah it is a niche music absolutely um, but uh, I know I'm I'm always checking out YouTube. I'm getting basically getting free lessons on, on YouTube all the time. Um, there's so many people doing really good things on uh, uh, jazz education, really. I guess. Yeah, and I guess a lot of rock and pop players might be interested in learning more in that direction, yeah. even if they're not jazzers. That yeah, I think so. I think you're right. Yeah, and it's I noticed with orchestral music. Actually, our um, music director now, Alexander Shelley, he's actually a jazz pianist. I don't know if you know that about him. I knew that he... I, I We did a gig one time a few years ago where... Um, oh, my goodness, I'm going to forget the name of the singer. There was a, um, a female uh, Canadian jazz singer on the on the bill. I've forgotten her name now. Um, and he played piano with her. And, uh, yeah, sounded good. No, I, but, you know, he'll be, you know, he'll be looking at the score and he'll just call out the name of the the chord which is clearly a jazz chord and I think it's right. it's very very easy for him to uh, memorize very difficult scores which really impresses me I'm wondering yeah. if that training might have helped him yeah I, I'm sure it did because I think it uh, uh, it's a way of I mean the the whole jazz chord system is a way of codifying um, uh, you know harmonies it's like when I even when I'm thinking of, I, I, I heard you guys play the Rite of Spring mm -hmm. um, a month ago, mm -hmm. and uh, what is it? Uh, that's an E flat seven over E. Yeah. And, uh, but I'm sure Stravinsky didn't think of it as that, you know. But it, there's, uh, jazz harmony gives you a way of identifying a chord, and it's not always accurate but at least gives you an idea of it so i can see that having uh training in in jazz piano you'd be able to look at the score and figure out what you could call that chord basically mm -hmm. and uh you know it's not not always totally accurate but um it's uh yeah it's a way to codify it you said you're ma mainly self-taught with jazz piano but did you study jazz piano with someone at a certain point i that's so funny I, I had to think about that no i never did um wow. it was always um like I said, when I moved to Toronto, I didn't tell anybody I played piano for the first several years because I just wanted to concentrate on the trombone. But at some point, um, people started asking me to to do gigs, and then I I <laughs> kind of a dark period where I I did a couple of years in uh, lounges doing lounges, mm -hmm. which I it was with singers, and it, and it was it, you know it, it was a good education, uh, but it was mostly playing top forty stuff in, yeah. in lounges. Um, so that was a way to, you know, to make a living. And, uh, in one, in one respect, it wasn't a great path because I was always busy six nights a week and, uh, somebody called me for a great jazz gig and I couldn't, couldn't do it. So, mm. um, yeah, I'm not sure about <laughs> whether that was a good move or not, but it's all, uh, it's all, uh, you know, part of the, part of the learning process. Yeah. So when you got out of that gig, was it like, did you just quit cold turkey or were you able to kind of phase out of that? Oh, I, um, I actually, um, I quit pretty much cold turkey because I decided I wanted to, uh, I came back to Ottawa and finished my degree. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get a little more education and, uh, and that sort of sent me on a different path. Yeah. Um, so, and also those kind of, uh, you know, in Toronto at that point, there were lounges uh, so many venues to play. I could play six nights a week with different singers all the time. There just isn't that anymore. Yeah. Uh, so in a, in a way, I feel for the young musicians because there aren't venues for them to play. I could go out every, you know, even when I was in my teens, every weekend I could go out and play and, and make a few bucks. But um, there just really isn't that anymore. So what kind of advice are you giving young players career-wise? Uh, yeah, I, I try not to give them advice career-wise because I don't want to be um, a downer. And so I try to concentrate on the art of the of the of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I don't think 
many of us get into music because we're gonna, we want to get rich, you know. So um, there are a lot of other a lot, a lot of other uh, uh, more stable uh, avenues to go than music if you want to do that. So I, I try to concentrate on just concentrate on the music, and I think that's why they you know people get into music because they 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 just can't help themselves you know they they really want to play music so that's what I try and concentrate in, on is the music and not so much uh, giving them any big career advice yeah do you um, have a certain routine yourself in terms of improvisation or um, keeping your chops up on the piano um, not really I mostly it's it's just playing with other people doing mm -hmm. gigs I I one of the actually one of the projects that I'm really enjoying right now I bought a uh, during the pandemic I bought a Hammond uh, SK2 which is a, a, a dual manual organ and um, I have a trio uh, called the Vista organ trio uh, with Scott Latham on drums and Alex Moxon on guitar and I'm really enjoying that right now so, uh, sorry, I, I, I started talking and I forgot your question. <laughs> oh, I was going to ask you about that organ, actually. Um, I was curious about yeah. your routine in terms of practicing. Or, like, oh, yes. So, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I, mm -hmm. Mostly it, it has to do with getting together with people and playing, doing gigs or doing rehearsals or, you know, jam sessions. Um, so uh, I probably do more of that than actually sitting at the piano figuring out, you know, how to improvise better. I should probably do more of that, but um, yeah, it, it mostly comes down to playing with other people. Yeah, and mm -hmm. as a composer, like I, a lot of my guests are improvisers and composers, so I'm always curious how that intersects for people. Right. Well, I find composition a very um, insular thing. I, I don't, I can't write with other people. I, I know some people do that, but um, I have to really, you know, when I write something, it takes a long time, and I, I come back to it. You know, I sleep on it, come back to it, edit it. Usually, take out a whole lot of notes that aren't shouldn't be there, uh, or un, are unnecessary. Um, and it's, uh, and then I'm constantly editing. You know, I'm always changing harmonies and and melody notes and that type of thing, adding sections. Um, so uh, yeah, I find that you know, playing music is a very um, social thing. For me, and uh, writing is very much uh, insular. Yeah. Do you have any other creative pursuits you do for fun that are creative? Well, um, I wouldn't. I I I'm a cyclist. I love to. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I cycle just about every day. I try and always get in at least twenty kilometers every day. So uh, I really enjoy that, um, and I like uh, cross country skiing and skiing in the winter. Um, but as far as creative, I'm not a, my wife is an artist. She, um, she's a visual artist. She, mm -hmm. she paints and, uh, I have no talent for that whatsoever. I've, <laughs> I've made some feeble attempts and uh, that's, that's not, not what I'm good at. Um, and, uh, yeah, so really I've always, like I said before, I've always been kind of on this music track and, yeah. uh, I don't think about a lot of other things. <laughs> So I guess the cycling, I was, I was curious, because um, you always seem fit and healthy, actually, because, you know, the late hours and, and the early mornings taking the train mm -hmm. and all that, it takes a toll and, yeah. you know, can be hard to... Well, you know, the, the best thing for um, our health as musicians who were working clubs was when they banned smoking. Yeah. That was, I always hated, I, I was never a smoker, I always hated cigarette smoke, hated coming home and having to, you know, put my clothes in another room because they smelled like smoke. Yeah, and uh, that was absolutely the, the the healthiest thing that could have happened for musicians like myself. <laughs> well, um, would you like to leave us with one last tune before we close out this conversation? Um, what could I do? Um, is there anything that you would uh, like to hear? Do you have a request? Um. Well, actually, I put you on the, the spot now, didn't I? Yeah, you know what. Um, there's a song that was played at our wedding, You'd Be Nice to Come Home To, which is a great classic. Ah, yeah. Do you know that one? Um, I, I do. Uh, I don't know if I know it well enough. Then um, and that's how, written by, who, who wrote that one? Do you remember? I don't know. I know Mark arranged it for um, Brass Quartet, actually. Um, right. 
but you know. <laughs> yeah, I sort I sort of know, but not yeah. not well enough to play it on the spot right now. Well, you know, uh, like how about like a, a blues tune, you know? Okay. Like different sure. style. Sure, I'll play I'll play a blues for you. Actually, I just thought of something. I'll play a blues that I wrote, and um, this is if if people who are listening to this live in Ottawa, they'll understand the title. It's called "Take the O Train," and it it has sort of some of the elements of the. Um, it hasn't been a smooth ride, you know, the train breaking down and so on. So yeah, this is this is a blues with a bridge actually. It's actually it's a you know the bridge is typically twelve bars. Mm -hmm. It's an eleven bar blues with a bridge. So it's it's a little little bit out, outside of the regular blues. Take the O train. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Well, it's really great getting to know you uh, better today, and uh, I'm sure my audience is going to so appreciate all your music as well. Oh well, I really enjoyed it, Leah. Thank you for asking me. I, I appreciate it very much. It's it's uh, it's interesting to actually have somebody um, ask you to talk about yourself. <laughs> yeah, it's different <laughs> than just. It is. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I'll... thanks very much. I re I really enjoyed it. It's great talking to you. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and you should check out some of my other interviews with jazz musicians, including Kelly Lee Evans, Roddy Elias, Eva Slongo, Diane Nalini, and Tracy Silverman. Please tell your friends about these episodes and sign up for my podcast newsletter to find out about upcoming artists and more, all linked at my podcast website, leahroseman.com, which is in the description of this episode. <laughs>